Hi, and welcome to Debunk File. My name is Sep, and today we are going to be looking at the fabled console, the Atari Mirai. The world of video games. Vast, bright, alluring sounds, colors, and atmosphere. Simply put, it's an experience of which nothing else can compare. From the days of old to now, video games are a landmark in creative and technical vision. Classic systems like the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Atari 2600, and of course, the godfather, the Magnavox Odyssey. There were many systems over many decades that defined a generation. You think of the 80s, you think of the aforementioned Atari 2600, and of course, the Nintendo Entertainment System. The 90s? That was ruled by the infamous console war between the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, and by the end of the decade, we made the leap to 3D graphics. But what about the systems that never were? The Sega Neptune, Magnavox Odyssey 3, the Atari Cosmos, Atari's Game Brain, these are all systems that for one reason or another never managed to come to fruition. Granted, with all of these consoles, we understand the tech and what they would have been, but there's one that stands out among the rest, that being the Atari Mirai. Before we can even talk about the Mirai, we need to set the stage for Atari and its competitors at the time. At the very beginning of Atari's lifespan with the 2600, there was competition, but in the simplest of terms, they ruled the industry. Even though rival consoles at the time, like the Intellivision and the ColecoVision, were more impressive graphically, it simply didn't matter. The Atari 2600 had this specific magic quality to it that stole the hearts of millions, and this magic is still able to be felt even when playing it today, all these years later. By the mid-80s though, things began to change. The NES came out to explosive success, quite literally saving the entire video game industry, and the Atari 2600 was simply left to the dust in comparison to this new kid on the block. Atari didn't give up without a fight though. In response to the NES, they came out with a new console, the Atari 7800. This console featured graphics that were significantly improved in comparison to the 2600, and the 5200 which isn't even worth speaking about. Despite this though, gamers at the time were still able to see that it just couldn't compare. It featured the same sound chip as the Atari 2600, which while I absolutely love those charming sound effects now, it simply was behind the times and people weren't interested in it. More importantly than the sound though, were the games. The Atari 2600 games were all about getting a high score, which was great for the time, but the NES came around with games that were actually beatable, and unfortunately, the majority of the 7800 games were still about reaching a high score, which again gave it the feeling of just being behind the times. For all of these reasons, the 7800 also failed heavily. Then the 90s came around. Nintendo was booming with their aforementioned NES and the SNES was just hitting the shelves. Sega was killing the market with their Genesis system, pitting two giants together, while on the other side of the year, Atari was, well, slowly falling apart. Attempting to capitalize on Nintendo's success with their handheld Game Boy, Atari released the Atari Lynx, which for the time was actually a pretty stellar handheld. But unfortunately, it couldn't even compare to the Game Boy's notoriety and convenience no matter how hard it tried. By the year 1992, Atari released the Atari Jaguar to pretty middling success. This was mostly due to the fact that it had to compete with the insane popularity of the SNES, which by 1992 was already owned by most kids who lived and breathed Nintendo. And those who didn't knew that Sega Genesis did what Nintendo. Oh, and it didn't help much either that the Jaguar was... terrible. Believe it or not, despite being against those remarkable odds, the Jaguar actually had a phenomenal marketing campaign that had people excited for it. At this time in the industry, essentially every console featured 16-bit graphics, but the Jaguar was boasting as featuring 64-bit graphics. That's what the Nintendo 64 featured, but the Jaguar came out many, many years before that. When people got their hands on the Jaguar, they realized that only a few games actually took advantage of these 64-bit capabilities. People found out that many of the games were extremely mundane and also saw this absolute behemoth of a controller. All of this and more left it gasping for air and then suddenly sputtering out as Atari's last true console. 
This left the Atari company to lose a lot of their stock and tons of money. Many offices were emptied, and this brings us to the Atari Mirai. In 1996, deep in an Atari office lay dormant the Atari Mirai. Nothing but a shell, the Mirai was a complete mystery. As previously mentioned, a lot of cancelled consoles, including some from Atari, were shells with hardware attached, and this is usually commonplace. We knew what they were supposed to be and how they would run, look, and behave, but not the Mirai. With nothing but a shell of a seemingly one-of-a-kind decaying console, it seems like the trail might end here, but of course, that is far from the case. The mystery only gets bigger. Looking at the console itself, many extreme video game enthusiasts had a theory that it might have been Atari's take on the spectacular console, the Neo Geo, which is a console we here at Debunk File have pretty publicly shown our appreciation for. The timeline adds up. The Neo Geo made by SNK was released in 1990 and was ridiculously expensive, leading to the console not really going anywhere. It seems the Mirai was going to capitalize on the complete, authentic arcade experience offered with the Neo Geo at a much more affordable price. This would make sense as the name Mirai when translated to English means future, the future of video games. Speaking of, the Japanese titling is the only time Atari has ever done anything like this, as previous console names were based on either numerics or cats. This also would add up as SNK was a Japanese company, there was also the console slot. As you can see, it's huge. The Neo Geo was known for having giant cartridges, so this of course sheds a lot of light into this possibility. Something else that adds more stability to SNK's involvement is the fact that Atari had been confirmed to have worked with multiple companies and even SNK themselves in the past. Yeah, for those of you who didn't know, in the years of 1983 to 1984, Atari actually had a deal with Nintendo to bring the Nintendo Famicom to America, but under Atari's own name. This would obviously fall apart and never happen, but it does show that Atari had a history of collaboration. They also tried to do this with Sega, and that never happened either. As for them working with SNK in the past, they both worked on porting SNK's classic arcade game, Akari Warriors. The one final, extremely important information worth noting here is that in California, there was actually both an SNK and Atari office right next to each other. Despite all of this, others would argue against the Neo Geo theory, specifically AtariMuseum.com, which judged the console with its pastel colored buttons to have been an 80s 16-bit console. Maybe a Jaguar prototype or a very early design for Atari's other cancelled console, the 32-bit Panther? This theory, however, is easily debunked due to that massive cartridge slot. Searching through the web for info on the Mirai brought me to a few forums discussing the topic, but the main one I saw was assemblergames.com, and the forum based on the Mirai is brilliant. One commenter goes over SNK and Atari having offices right next to each other and were apparently working on a project together. Maybe the Mirai wasn't a clone, but a joint project. It's hard to say since that SNK office didn't create any hardware. The next theory about what this console was is slightly similar to the Neo Geo theory, and that is, this console was actually a clone of Atari's home line of computers called the STs. Something that helps to prove this theory would have to be Atari's final console in the 8-bit era. It was called the Atari Zegs, and well, just look at it. It looks exactly like the Mirai. This console actually was a clone of one of Atari's already existing computer models, that being the Atari 65XE. When looking at this console, you can certainly see it, and it's quite the odd looking console to say the least. Besides the overwhelming similar design when it comes to its coloring and buttons on the front, this console featured both a cartridge slot and a keyboard, essentially giving it the appearance of some sort of Frankenstein monster. So, could the Atari Mirai have been another version of this console? Perhaps an upgraded model of it for the 16-bit generation instead of the 8-bit? I'd say it seems pretty possible. This just leaves us with the question of the huge console slot yet again. That would bring us back to SNK, as their connections to this, as established, are pretty set in stone. So if this theory is legit, the Atari Mirai would essentially be a 16-bit version of the Atari Zegs, and to help with that, they called forth the SNK. This theory combines our joint project theory and adds more context to it, and I honestly find it very possible. 
It's frankly impossible to ever prove this without a shadow of the doubt, especially since this canned console just has so little information to it. But with working with what we have, this is the best we can come up with. Further questions you could ask are what the game library would have been like if this theory is in fact true, and for that, we could only speculate. A more affordable console with Neo Geo capabilities would be mouth-watering to us. Would the games function like that and also be arcade styled, or would they try to modernize it by making the games actually beatable like its competitors? If they went with the latter and they featured Neo Geo level graphics, I can't even imagine how great the Mirai could have been. Or is none of this at all true because we're completely wrong? Unfortunately, we'll never know. The only lead that I am extremely certain about would have to be SNK's involvement. While it was never confirmed, the sheer amount of evidence leaning in that direction is just way, way too much to ignore. With all of that said though, that's why it's one of gaming's greatest mysteries. On July 30th, 1996, Atari went defunct. What once was the top innovator in gaming was now unable to adapt with the times and faded out while the rest of the world went on. The tale of the company is tragic, and because of that, we'll likely never receive our answers regarding this console here. What if the Mirai was truly something game-changing, but they just were unable to release it due to past failures? Or perhaps even more disappointing, what if it too was flawed? All we can do at this point is imagine. The human mind likes focusing on the negatives, but for Atari, we aren't going to do that. In our hearts, we want to remember them as pioneers, the creators of the first truly great gaming console, and the company responsible for the popularization of the entire concept of home video gaming in the first place. For the company's grand finale, they left us with one of the greatest gaming mysteries of all time. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to follow all of our social medias for updates and exclusive content all linked in the description. We would also love you guys to consider joining our brand new Patreon, Debunk Plus, for only a dollar a month. You get access to videos early, exclusive content, and our brand new podcasts, which as of recording, two are already up, so please go check them out. And of course, make sure to like this video, share this with your friends, and subscribe. As always, my name is Seb from Debunk File. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.